You are tuned in to your weekly Sunday morning word broadcast, Rhema Power, with Reverend Ni Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor of Powerhouse Ministries International, a program designed to improve your understanding into the Word of God, bring you practical solutions, and empower you to rise above life's daily challenges. Stay tuned. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Mana, a weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek His face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the Word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. Today I'm bringing a grand finale to the subject of excellence. And I want to call this the spirit of excellence. We started with the pursuit of excellence. Two weeks ago, I shared with you on how to cultivate excellence. And today, I call this the spirit of excellence. One of the things about life is that life moves on very fast. And sometimes, you are left behind and you are wondering, where has time gone? We all have to learn to make the most of our time and accomplish the vision God has given us. Turn your Bible to John chapter 10 and let's read verse 10 together. John chapter 10. Verse 10. Shall we already together? One, two, go. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Say with me, I am come. This was Jesus' mission statement. And I believe that every child of God must position yourself in alignment with this statement. I am come. There may have been a lot of things that have gone wrong in your family, but you are come. There may be a lot of things that are going wrong in your environment, in your community, but I am come. There must be a purpose for which you have come. There must be a reason for which you have come. Why have you come? The thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I am come. Lift up your hand and declare, I am come. Why have you come? I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I believe that the whole spirit of excellence revolves around two major questions. Why are you alive? Why do you do what you do? And I believe that every action must be filtered through the spectacle of these two questions. Will it give life? Will it save life? And number two, will it improve life? So every action that we do you need to ask yourself these questions. What I am doing, will it give or save life? And number two, will it improve life? So if you already have life and I come into your life, I will be an addition, I will improve. If you don't have life and I come into your life, I will give you life. Now, whether you sell, whether you're a teacher, whether you work in an office, whether you're a pastor, if you begin to filter your actions through these questions, you will position yourself to be a blessing. Do I give life? Do I save life? Do I improve life? If I sell kinky, if I sell in a shop, the way I receive my customers, does it give life? Does it improve their lives, what I'm selling? If I'm a tailor, if I'm a seamstress, what I do, will it rather take life away from people? Will it cause them harm? If I'm a driver, the way I drive, is it to save life? or is to kill. You see, every time you see killing, every time you see take away, you must identify who is behind it. It's the devil. So one of the major difference between us and the devil is not because we come to church. It's whether your actions 
give life. So if, for example, I'm selling something that is supposed to be one kilogram, and I short change the person and I give him 900 grams, have I given life or have taken life? If I'm supposed to sell something that is one kilo and I under invoice it, have I given life or have I taken life? You see, Christianity is a very simple, for, for want of a better word, religion. But we make a lot of things complex. So if you want to know whether you are a child of God, it means that you are following Christ. Your main purpose is to give life and to improve life. And that is how we judge ourselves. We must judge ourselves by our final product that is given to humanity. Do we give life and do we improve life? So I personally believe that there are four things that will drive this mission. Number one, it's a deep love for God and a deep love for mankind. Because you love God, you give life. Because you love God, you love his creation. And because God gives life, you want things around you to live. So your understanding of God, your appreciation of God, your closeness to God will manifest in giving life. When you walk into your office, when you walk into your community, what's your agenda? I give life. Say with me, I give life. So when I come into your life, you will improve. You must improve. Why? Because that is why God has made me, to give life. The second thing that drives this is what I call servant leadership. Jesus Christ said, if anybody wants to be great amongst you, let him be a servant. So you serve, you find out the needs of people, and you meet it. It means that you give them life. If there's a lack in their lives, when you come into their life, you help them remove the lack. The third way is truth as a foundation. To walk in truth, not in a lie, but in truth. Are you truthful? When you say it's A, is it A? When you give your word, can it be relied upon? And then number four is faithfulness. You do everything to keep your word. The Bible says that it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So you find out that when you begin to live like that, one of the natural things that will begin to manifest is excellence. Because look, excellence gives life. The things that really matter, that save people, is founded upon a spirit of excellence. So if I go to a hospital, or if I go to a drug store and I buy a drug, I am expecting that the drug will give me life. That when I take the drug, I will be better. I won't be worse. When I sit on a ship or I sit in a plane, I'm expecting that it will take me to my destination. I'm not thinking that somebody didn't do his work and the plane will crash. So you find out that if a doctor comes to operate upon you, I'm expecting that he will do the right thing. And to be a doctor, you know, there are things that they give life. So every one of us, it doesn't matter whether you do hair or you sell kinky, you've got to ask yourself, do you give life? If you don't give life, forget about the tongues you are speaking. You do not have a spirit of excellence. Excellence will create trust. Excellence will improve lives. And we've gone over that in the past two weeks. So because there's a spirit of excellence, our tomorrow will be better than today. So our future will be brighter. If there's no excellence and things are going worse, it means that our future is going to be bleak. So if we want our future to be better, we all have to begin to understand how to be excellent. That the things we see today and do today, the institutions we build today will be better tomorrow. They won't be worse. But if our hospitals are going to be worse, if our police are going to be worse, if the human beings are going to be worse, then our future has been destroyed. So whatever we do, we must get better. We mustn't stagnate. We must get better. One of the things that we should not tolerate are excuses. And I want to say this. Why you do something and you are constantly floundering and you accept it as normal. You've done something for how many weeks or how many months or how many years and yet when you have to do it again, there are problems. And then you say it's normal. It's not normal. It's abnormal. So we must get better. I want to drive and believe God that by the spirit of God, we will get better and excellent. So whatever you do, whether you are an usher, whether you are a driver, whether you are a carpenter, what must be our aim to get better? Do you sweep? Do you preach? Do you pray? What must be your aim? Get better. Become excellent. If you project sound, if you arrange things, get better. If you are filing, get better. Drive yourself to get better. So this is the whole spirit of excellence. The way you respond to things around you and the kind of attitudes and responses that makes life better on earth 
is the spirit of excellence. I'm going to start with a question. Why do we do what we do? Why do we behave the way we behave? Why is it that some people are rich and some people are poor? Why is it that some people find it difficult to change? What are the things that influence the choices we make? Why are some people excellent and some are not? And how come even in the midst of plenty and abundance, some are unable to help themselves? I told you, if you don't have that inner desire yourself to excel, no matter what is given to you will go waste. Ghana, they'll give us gold. They'll give us good weather. They'll give us oil. They'll give us everything, cocoa, everything. You see the easy way out? Let's sell it to other people. We need a people who want to get better. And I pray for you that this spirit will fall upon this church. And when I say spirit, I'm not talking about something moving in the air that will come and possess you and immediately, no, no, no. When you say the spirit of excellence, you are actually talking about the attitude. Another word for the word spirit is attitude, okay? The attitude of excellence. So every time you hear the word spirit, one of the things you can substitute for it is an attitude. So everything that we do has a why. Whether this why was embedded in our subconscious through constant reminding or whether we simply adopted it as a philosophy or a question or something, we will talk about it. But everybody, you need to ask yourself, why do you do the things you do? Why do you dress the way you dress? Why do you come the way you come? Why are some people always late and some people always early? Why do some people go to school and do well and some people go to school and do well? Why? Why? Why do some people become rich and others people become poor? Aren't we all human beings? And, and that is why this subject is so critical. Because you've got to ask yourself why. Why is it that every day you don't have food? Why is it that every year you are broke? Why? Today, I'm going to identify seven steps or processes that influences everything you do. And hopefully, this will also give you a better understanding of the why, the issues that motivate your actions. Secondly, I hope that you'll be able to identify aspects of your life that you must work on to develop the spirit of excellence. So what is number one? The first step or the first process is what I call the environment. Somebody say the environment. The environment simply means what people do and believe around you. I don't know how old you are, but there's a question to ask. When you were born, was the world already in existence or did the world start functioning when you were born? The world was already in existence, wasn't it? So what it means is that the world was functioning before you were born. There were people you came to meet in the world who knew something, who believed some things, who also behaved in a certain way. You were born, you didn't know anything. You arrived with a blank mind into a certain geographical space, maybe called Ghana or Choco, and you met some people in that society, and so whatever those people knew, that is what they teach you, isn't it? Okay. So what people know around you, that is what they teach you and that is what you learn. So one of the first things that happens is that you begin to learn from your environment. If, for example, you are born in Japan, you will learn what the Japanese know. If you are born in China, in that environment, the Chinese will teach you. If you are born in America, it's an environment the Americans will teach you. If you are born in Togo, the Togolese will teach you. If you are born in Kumasi, you may not understand why you struggle with certain words, but the environment will teach you. If you are born in Choco, hmm. you see, I'm trying to show you why you behave the way you do because you've never asked yourself why and why some people are stuck and why some people do things a particular way. And it's as if some people are more blessed and some people, dear, it's like they are struggling. But you've got to understand that you are influenced by your environment. The only thing is that if the people who you came to meet if they know what is good, they will teach you good. But if the people also don't know what is good, <laughs> that is what they will teach you. So you find out that maybe as you are growing, you start drinking. Because you've seen a lot of people who wake up in the morning, and the first thing they do is they want to drink. When you are growing, you wake up in the morning, you wake up quickly and have your bath. Why? Because that is what they taught you. And in another area, bathing is a luxury. And if you don't learn that the environment has an influence on you, that is why Jesus Christ says, I am in the world, but I refuse to let the world environment dictate to me and determine who I'll be. Because if you are not careful, if you are not born in a good environment, the bad environment will influence you and teach you things and you will end up becoming something you don't want to become. So you wake up in the morning, you don't bath. Something that simple. Why? Because the environment taught you. 
You wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is you bath quickly and you want to go to work. Why? Because you can learn it from your environment. The first thing that influences and teach you what to do is the environment. The second thing that influences you is what I call knowledge, what you know. What you know is based on the environment. The people were there and they taught you something. You learned it and that became your knowledge. So where did you learn that if you wake up in the morning, you must bath or brush your teeth? The environment. They taught you. The people you came to meet taught you. So if, for example, you go to a workplace where people go late or when people go, they are lazy. <laughs> they don't do any work. They gossip and they talk and they, you find out that the environment was teaching you things that are bad. And in another environment, it teaches you also things that are good. You see, some people don't appreciate the environment in church. Some people fight a certain good environment. Some people take away life and other people give life. So if you are not careful, you are in an environment, you are always taking away, taking away, taking away, insults, quarrels, backbiting, stealing. Where did you learn it? The environment. Quarreling. The environment taught you what you know. And because they taught you what you know, your knowledge is based on the people around you who are teaching you in the environment. The third thing that influences what you do is your experiences. Things you have gone through in your life. Everybody has gone through something. First, you learn it from the environment and then you experience it yourself. So, there are things you experienced in your environment because your environment gave you experiences and you learned those things and you personally experienced them. So, now it has become yours. The environment taught you that maybe you bath outside. So, now you've also bathed outside. You've experienced it. It's become your experience. And then the fourth thing is what you accept as true. It becomes your beliefs. So look at it. The environment gives you knowledge. The knowledge gives you experiences. And the experiences gives you a belief system. Which becomes a part of you and your lifestyle, your culture. Because you have experienced it, you confirm that it is true. And it's a belief. This is what I believe is true. The fifth is your values. What you consider to be very important and treasure and will hold on to. You see, why do some people consider bathing, and, and sorry I'm using very simple things, but I want to just appreciate it. I'll come to a bit more. But why should some people consider bathing very important and other people consider it's not important? Why do some people consider savings very important and other people consider spending more important? Why do some people consider giving at funerals more important than maybe education? So they would rather buy a funeral cloth than pay school fees or buy electricity or buy water. Why? Because they learned it from their environment. They believe that funerals are important, more important than education. They believe that buying a cloth for a funeral is more prestigious than going to school. Why? Where did they learn it from? Because they learned it from their environment. They believe that that is what is important. They believe that that is what is true. And then they consider their values. As for us, this is what we value. We value funerals. You see, we value litigation. <laughs> oh, yeah. It becomes their values. Values are what you consider to be important. And you hold on to it. Then out of your values, the sixth thing that influences you are your choices. What you see as right. So when you have a value, okay, you consider a funeral important than education. When you have to make a choice, it is based on your values. So because you consider funeral more important, you would rather buy the funeral cloth than pay your child's school fees. Because you've been programmed, your values have been determined by your belief systems which you learned from your environment. So you may see somebody who doesn't have money for electricity, says he doesn't have money for school fees, he doesn't even have money to buy drugs, and yet that person has an outdooring. And all of a sudden, that person will be able to hire a band and play the whole day and pay a spinner and serve drinks for everybody. Why? Because the system has taught him that that's a value. In another environment, that's not valuable. They value education more. So they won't have funeral. They won't have outdooring but they will send their children to school. Where does all this come from? The environment. So based on their choices now, it informs their actions, what they do. So if you look at the progression, why do I do the things I do? You will find out that it starts from, it's not just something that you just pick up and do. You don't realize it, but it starts from your environment. And your environment has given you knowledge. And your knowledge has given you experiences. And your experiences have given you beliefs. And your beliefs have given you values. And your values determine your choices. 
and then your choices determine your actions. So long before somebody does something, it is not just this is what I do. It is something that has a progression. You may not be fully aware of it, but you do the things because that is what you have been processed. And unfortunately, if you don't learn how to break it, it becomes a stronghold. And you find out that you are helpless. You are yoked. You don't like it, but you too, when you have children, your children won't go to school. They will also value funerals. They won't save. They won't buy anything. They will build a house without a washroom. Because the environment, where did they learn all that from? So before you end up doing something, so many factors have influenced you. The environment you grew up in gives you what you learned and gives you experiences that have formed your beliefs and determined your values. Now you make choices based on a value system and all this reflects in your actions. If you want to change what you do, what must you change first? The environment. Haven't you noticed how the same African in an African environment who says, I can't get up, I won't go to work. As for me, I believe in free range. I believe in batting outside. I believe in spitting outside. That same African. You take him out of Africa and you put him in Europe. Hey, all of a sudden, without education, without teaching him, he will change. Why? The environment. The environment. Somebody who says, oh, as for me, when I see the traffic light and it's getting red, I have to cross it. And he will cross it and take a shortcut. All the motor riders. I bet you if we took all of them, they haven't changed. We haven't changed their dressing. And we take all of them who say they won't obey traffic rules and put them into Europe or America or Dubai. Without any education, find out that without anybody telling them, they will change. Why? Because the environment determines your actions. All of you who come to church late, all of you who go to work late, all of you who give excuses, I don't understand, I don't know what you are saying, I can't follow instructions. You find another environment and you will be surprised. You see, if we are serious about development, the choir creates an environment, the prayer warriors create an environment, the church creates an environment, Choco creates an environment. We can put many more buildings, we can build whatever it is, but if the environment there's an environment that breeds success. The schools that we call good schools, it's not because the buildings or the human beings are different. They're also human beings. But the teachers and the headmasters have created an environment. Even if you are A, when you enter into that environment, I remember many years ago, I was in the U.S. and I was coming back to Ghana. I went to preach and a certain gentleman came to me and said he wanted to, you know, send something to his relatives in Akimoda. And I asked him, how long have you been here? He said, oh, about two years. And I said, what were you doing in Ghana? He said something I don't want to talk about. And then he said, oh, I now have this, I've done this, I've done this, and I've done that. And I said, when you were in Ghana, didn't you save? How come you've come out of Ghana, you are doing two jobs, you have saved enough money. Within two years, you've done this, you've done this, and you are sending all this money back to Akimoda. Because there's an environment that will make you work hard. There's an environment that will make you truthful. There's an environment that will make you respect life. There's an environment that will make you keep your word. There's an environment when you take somebody's job, you will deliver. And this is where the battle really is. And so the question I ask you is, will you win the battle of life? Can you do it for yourself? Will you tell yourself, I'm not going to be under the environment of Ghana, but I'm going to be the environment of the kingdom because God is no respecter of persons. So as long as you start with petty things, as for Ghana, I can be late. It doesn't matter if I come 10 minutes late after I'm earlier than other people. You see why some people are poor and some people are rich? Why some people become leaders? Why some people become influential? Why some people are able to achieve a lot? Because they work on their environment. If you don't do well in life, don't blame witches. And there are more witches in China and Dubai and India, even by population, just by extrapolating population. If there are 30 million people in Ghana and there are 1 billion people, that's 300 times or more. Because when you begin to do the right thing, the demons, you don't give them a chance. That is why when Jesus Christ comes into our hearts to change us, he puts us in another kingdom. You see, turn your Bible to Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13. Let's all read it together. One, two, go. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. What is the first thing that happens when you get born again? God takes you out of one kingdom where it's like the environment was stifling and limiting and led you to death. 
And the first thing he does is he translates you and puts you into another kingdom where you can live. Because if you stay in that kingdom, you will die. So look at what he says. He says, who has delivered us? So you find out, he has already delivered us. I'm delivered. I'm not now looking for deliverance. When I got born again, I was taken out. He has delivered us. I'm not now born again going around looking for deliverance. I'm going to live in the reality of what has happened. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. It means that there was a power under which we operated. It's called the power of darkness. And when Jesus Christ came, he delivered us. He's not now delivering you. He delivered, he took us out. He, he fought the devil. He took us out. He says, no, this is not a good place to be. And then he translated you and put you in another kingdom. And the Bible says it's the kingdom of his dear son. One of the things that I've noticed in life about people is that people who have moved out of a kingdom that is stifling and dying, and then they move into another kingdom, and they don't realize that there's a new king, new laws. You see, you want to be able to move out of mediocrity and death into light and excellence and life. When you are taken out of one kingdom and moved into another kingdom, the laws have changed. The rules have changed. So if, for example, I live in Choco and I wake up in the morning, I don't bath. I wake up in the morning, I throw my rubbish on the streets in Choco and nobody minds me. If I move out of that kingdom and I'm taken to a kingdom of America and I decide that as for me, I'm taking my habits from Choco to America, I will spit on the road. I will bath on the streets. I will stand in my house and shout. I'll have a funeral on the streets. You are in America but you have very bad experiences. So even though you have changed and you have moved to another kingdom, you are in prison, you are being beaten, every day you are being harassed, you are paying fines. So even though you are in America, you struggle. Why? Because you took your old habits, which may have been permitted under the Choco kingdom, and you are trying to do the same thing in America, where they don't allow that. And this is the challenge for many of you. You see, you are born again, but you are still the old man. You are trying to put the old wine into new wineskins. You don't want to change anything about you. You don't realize that now punctuality is important. Now truthfulness is important. Now being faithful is important. Now being honest is important. Now reading your Bible is important. Because the environment that taught you didn't teach you good things. And so now every day you are looking for deliverance. But he says he has delivered you. In this new kingdom, you don't run around looking for deliverance. You just walk into it and start living by the rules. And start living by the kingdom lifestyle. And all of a sudden, you've left behind it. All of a sudden, you find out that a lot of things you couldn't save, now you are saving. You couldn't tidy your house, now you are tidying your house. You couldn't dispose of your rubbish, now you are doing it. You couldn't learn, you couldn't read, but now all of a sudden, aggressively you are reading. And so all of a sudden, life has changed. And you find out that you don't want to come back again to the old place. So the Bible says that if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. All things are past. The choco life is past. The life of lateness is over. The life of mediocrity is over. The life of stealing and being rude and littering and throwing things around is over. The life of traveling through traffic lights is over. The life of drinking and driving is over. Why? You've changed kingdoms. You've changed kingdoms. We'll continue next week. Put your hands together for the Lord. Hello precious one, we wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15am for the morning glory service, at 7.30am for the second service which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms and at 9.45am for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Manor, our weekday Bible teaching service which comes off every Tuesday at 6pm and Thursday at 6.30pm in person and online respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek his face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. Thank you. 
for listening to Rhema Power with Reverend Nee Bernard Adiakwa. We hope you've been blessed. For further information, contact 0303-931-841. Tune in next week for another insightful teaching on Rhema Power.